QuickBooks Online 2024. Cash payment for inventory linked to purchase order form, otherwise known as the PO form. Get ready and some coffee because we're going to save time with QuickBooks Online 2024. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Here we are in our Get Great Guitars 2024 QuickBooks Online sample company file we set up in a prior presentation. Opening up the major financial statement reports like we do every time, reports on the left. In the favorites, we're going to be right-clicking on that balance sheet. Open link in new tab. Right-clicking on the P&L, otherwise known as the income statement or profit and loss. Right-clicking on the trial balance to once again open in a new tab. If you don't have the trial balance in the favorites, you can open it up top, searching it here. Tab to the right, closing up the hamburger. We're going to change the range up top just for the first month of 2024. 010124 tab 013124. And then we're going to go for a run because it's refreshing. Tabbing to the right, closing up the hamburger and doing the range change again. 010124 tab 013124 tab. Running again, another run. And then we'll tab to the right, close up the hamburger and we'll change the range one more time. 010124. 013124 and another run. I'm not sure these runs are refreshing anymore. I'm getting tired, but that's okay. They're, they're short runs. They're still refresh. All right, let's go back to the balance sheet. Quick recap on what we have done thus far. We set up the company file, laid down the foundational items necessary in order to do the normal accounting cycle process. Those usually found in the COG, where we looked at the company settings, the managing the users, the lists like the chart of accounts, the products and services, the customers, the vendors, and uh, the employees. Then we took what we imagined to be the beginning balances as of our prior accounting system, or the ending balances as of the prior accounting system, entered them as our beginning balances for our current system, which we're going to start doing in January of 2024. Then we entered some transactions typical to a new business, including trying to get some cash so that we can then buy the things we need to generate revenue, the investments in fixed assets, property, plants, and equipment, and inventory. Once we had the cash on hand, we bought the fixed assets or some fixed assets, even though some of them were stolen. And then we went and we bought some inventory. So, but well, we, we just sent a purchase order out for the inventory. We're trying to buy the inventory. That's where we're at now. So we sent out the purchase order for the inventory. And now we're going to imagine that the inventory has arrived. No one has stolen it thus far. And we're, we actually are going to be able to continue with the business. We open up the box and there's a bill in it. So let's recap the process real quick using a flowchart over here. And this is the desktop flowchart, but we're just looking at the flow of the forms, which is the same for just about any accounting system. So remember that inventory is going to be both on the purchasing side of things as well as the sales side of things. We're using a perpetual inventory system, the full service inventory system in our practice problem. Note that if you're buying inventory, if you buy inventory similar to you buying something from like an online store, like an Amazon or something like that, you would pay for the stuff that you buy when you purchase it. But if you're a larger company and you're ordering like manufactured products like from China or something that's going to manufacture them over there or something because it's cheaper, then uh, they might you might have a situation where you can order the inventory, they send it to you before you pay for them, and then you would expect when you've received the inventory, it will have a bill with it. That's what we did last time. We entered the purchase order, which is simply a request form, which we track, which looks like 
It's a form that would record something, looks like a bill or a check form, but it doesn't actually record anything. Once we get the stuff and check it out, then we are going to have the bill with it. We can enter the bill into the system either as a bill or we can simply pay off the bill. And this is an, a, a useful time here to remember the differences between normal terminology and QuickBooks terminology. Even accounting terminology note is a lot broader than QuickBooks or most accounting software terminology. So in other words, if someone says, I was billed for something, that, that generally means that you've received a bill. In this case, we got a bill from our vendors for the purchase of the inventory. But a bill form for QuickBooks means specifically that we're increasing the accounts payable. So, so if I put it into the system as a bill, we're increasing accounts payable. If I take that bill and just pay it with an electronic transfer, we're paying it with similar to a check form or expense form. So we, even though we can say we got a bill, we didn't enter it as a bill in the system. We entered it as an expense or check form. We simply paid off the bill. So it's not a bill for QuickBooks terminology, right? We can also say that we got invoiced from a client. Those words are interchangeable from a normal, even accounting kind of terminology. But on our side of things within QuickBooks, we don't call the, the invoice form is the thing that we give to our clients, right? But if it says an invoice on the other side of the table, it's a bill to them. That's why invoice and bill are basically interchangeable with normal language. But when you get into software language, a bill means that you that not only you got something from your vendor, someone that you need to pay money ultimately going out, but you're entering in the system in such a way that it's going to increase accounts payable rather than just paying it off. Now that in this system or the first month, we're going to not use accounts payable as much and do more of a cash based system. So we're going to take that bill and just simply pay it off with a check form or expense form. So that's going to be the process now. So if I go to the first tab, we'll recall what we did last time. If I hit the drop down, we know that the purchase orders are under the vendor section and they're under the POs, the purchase orders here. We can track the purchase orders in the expenses area, which I would call the, the vendor center. And we can then go into here and we could track them by going to our expenses. And we could say, okay, there's our purchase orders. We might be looking for the, the purchase orders, for example, drop down. I just want to see the purchase orders. And maybe I want to see those that are open, open purchase orders. And then when I get the box that has the guitars in them, I can match them out to the particular purchase order that we have sent out. We can also see the purchase orders by vendor and break them out by the vendor. So when I get the box of stuff, so I've gone into the blue here, I can see these vendors are the ones that have the open purchase order. So if I get something from Diamond Head, I can go into here, Epiphone, Gibson, and so on. So let's say we got a box of guitars from Epiphone that we ordered. So let's go into that one. We've got our multiple purchase orders that we could be taking a look at. If I select the drop down, then it says copy to a bill. That would typically be the next step. We're going to enter a bill. And that's usually what we do. We enter a bill, but I'm going to pay it off with, with simply a check form this time. So, so instead of doing that, let's do it this way. Let's hit the plus button up top and I'm in the vendor's expense. Here's the check form. I'm going to enter a check form. I want to match this check form out to the purchase order, which it should give me an option to do if I select the vendor, Epiphone. We're going to say Epiphone and then boom, it, on the side, it gives me uh, these items. Here's the two purchase orders and we have this bill that's outstanding, but here's the two purchase orders that we could be pulling in if we so choose. And that is indeed what we do choose to do. So let's go ahead and just add the purchase order detail. And then I'm going to do the same for this one. We're going to add the purchase order. All right, let's tap through this. We're going to say it's Epiphone. It's going to be coming from the checking account and let's bring it to the 14th. I'm going to say this happened on January 14th and we'll put the check number in. So let's put a check number in. I'll put starting with 
the 1004. Now the check numbers are a little bit different. Notice that most forms will have a numbering system like the invoices will have an automatic numbering system. With the checks, if you're actually physically writing checks within QuickBooks, which a lot of people aren't doing anymore because they're going to electronic kind of transactions, but we just wanna point out the checks here in case you still want to be processing checks in some way shape or form how could you do that if you want to well you can purchase the physical checks which already have check numbers on them you can't print a check from quickbooks on just a blank piece of paper you need the physical checks the checks will already have check numbers on them and then you can add that first check number into the system then after you do that all the check numbers will populate automatically just one number at a time and that number should tie into what your physical checks say which gives you that kind of internal control over the over over your checks then you have the print later if you want to be printing them later remember that if you have multiple checks that could be a useful thing to do because you might want to enter multiple checks into the system and then print them all at one time then putting the checks into your into your printer the proper way <laughs> and then uh, print all of them at one time, but we're not gonna print them later here. All right, so as we go through here, we're not gonna have any tags. Notice it's not going to a category. The check form is like an expense form, except now we have a check number related to it. This is the form that decreases the checking account. We're not gonna apply them to a category that would be like applying it to the telephone expense or something like that, but instead we're gonna use items. The items will still record things to a category, but it will record things to the category driven by the items, which of course, in this case, we're purchasing inventory, means that we're gonna be in increasing uh, the inventory accounts in dollar amount, as well as we're gonna be increasing the units of inventory. So let, let me copy this over. I'm gonna right click and duplicate this just to get an idea of, of a recap of that. I'm gonna pull this to the left and then I'm going to close out this form and just recall that we entered in the sales tab. We entered the products and services over here. And so here we have our products of services and these are the inventory items. And when we look at the inventory items, they have a price and a cost. We are purchasing, how come the, this one is the same? I think this one, there's something wrong with that one, but we'll deal with that in a second. Actually, I think that's just something weird to happen because if I edit this, you can see in here that the sales price is, in this case, 500 and the cost is 400 The point is the price and the cost are going to be different. What's going to populate now should be the 400 because we're purchasing them at this time. And when we sell them, that's when it should populate with the 500 on the invoice and the sales forms. Now, I also want to point out that we could use the billing items uh, for this process, but it's not a perfect system. So I just want to remember where they were, those are located in the cog dropdown, account and settings, and then under the expenses on the left-hand side, we turned on the bills and expense. So right here it says make expenses and items billable. So that is on so we can track billable expenses and, and items as income in a single account. So that's what we have done. We've turned that on. Why is that important with a purchase order? If I go back to the purchase order, you'll remember that these two up top, we assigned a customer to. Why did we do that? Well, we've got our box of guitars that we received from our vendor. And these two purchases of the guitars, we bought specifically for a particular customer, which our vendor didn't care about. Epifun doesn't care about the, the customers. That's not why we put it there. We put that there so now when I get the guitars, I can remind myself that I need to turn around and sell this with an invoice or sales receipt form to this customer, Eric Music. Now you might think, well, look at that. I got this billable thing. These two tabs are there because, or these two columns are there because we turned on that preference. So you could say, well, why don't I just make it billable and taxable because we're gonna say they're taxable. And then when I pull it into the invoice, they will populate on the invoice. Now, this is not a perfect system because when it pulls into the invoice, it's gonna pull in the, the cost, I believe. If you're used to the desktop version, the desktop version, for some reason, this is one thing it did better. It, like, it pulled it into the invoice properly with the sales tab. This one is gonna link it uh, to, and it's gonna pull in the cost. So just 
for example, if I looked up here and if we had like an expense that we purchased like gasoline or something, and then we wanted to pull the gasoline cost with the billable item into an invoice, it makes sense that it would pull in the cost that would come into the invoice. And if I did that and I only assigned a, a, uh, an account to it, then QuickBooks doesn't know what account to use on the invoice. It's just going to assign it to one income account because we, we don't want it to decrease like auto expense in that case. We wanted to put the on the invoice the increase to an income account, not a negative expense account. So you can see why that would work that how that would work up here. Down here though, these are items. So the items you would like to be the item is the thing that's driving which account it should go to. So when this goes over to the invoice, we would like it to, to be driven by the fact that this is an item and hit the proper income account according to the item, not according to just the billable, just the billable account here for billable income. And we would like it not to pull in the cost, but we would like to, it to pull in the sales price and in and, and that format. So I just want to show you that you could do this, but it's not a perfect system. I'll show you kind of why. And it's a good explanation of what kind of happens with these billable things and how you might want to uh, put together workarounds if you're using them. All right, so let's record it. When we record it, what's it going to do? Decrease the checking account because it's a check form. And the other side is going to go to inventory. And, and it's going to go to inventory by the total dollar amount. And it's going to have an impact on the inventory subledger tracking both units and dollars. And so down below, we can cancel it. We can clear it. We can print it. Uh, we can uh, uh, order checks, make it reoccurring. Or under the more, we could void it. We can save and close, we can save and new. Let's go to save and close on it. And then let's tab to the right and see the journal entry. I'm gonna run it again to refresh it. Go to a nice refreshing run. And then we'll go into the checking account and check out the checking. And we can see there's our check. There's the check number. And if I go into it, it's gonna take us back to that check form. We go into it, it goes back to the check form. Close now. now the other side, it didn't tell us where it went, even though it went only to one other account because there's multiple line items. So if I, so that's why it kind of dashes that out, even though it's only in one other account over here on the inventory asset. So there it is here. So notice we have multiple check forms in here, but all the check are, it's all the same form. It put them in by line item, possibly in part because QuickBooks is trying to track the inventory on like a first in first out method the flow assumption it's using let's go back on over there's nothing in the profit and loss yet the trial balance updates of course let's open up another report the inventory subledger right clicking on this tab to duplicate it and then i'm going to go into the reports on the left hand side and i just like typing in up top inventory inventory valuation summary so if I go into the inventory valuation summary and this date's fine, that'll be fine. And so we're going to say, well, let's change it because you might be working at a separate date. 013124, run it. And so here's the quantity of inventory that we have now. And the total is the 39,976. This is the cost, not the sales price. So that should tie into what's over here. 39... Um, 39,976. Okay. Internally, let's go to the internal area. Let's go here. And if I go into my expenses, so now I'm just to recap, we're on the expenses tab and then we're in the expenses drop down. and you can see I'm filtered by purchase orders. And then I'm only looking, however, at the open purchase orders. So I only have these three in here. If I switch this to the closed purchase orders, there's the purchase orders that are closed. If I go to all purchase orders, then of course we can see all of them. If I go to my vendors, this blue thing only shows the open purchase orders. So there's the ones that we have not yet done anything with. If I clear the filters here and I go into Epiphone, here's the detail for Epiphone. Uh, hold on a sec. Let's go into the detail. So now we see the purchase orders and we see the check form. If I go into a particular purchase order, so now we see the status here changed to closed and it's linked to a check. 
So look at this beautiful linking process. This is why we can't just do this with journal entries because all these forms kind of link together and it pulls me right over to the check. And here's the two transactions linked to the check. Closing that out, if I go into the check this way, we can also see it this way. Here's the two transactions that are linked to the check. If I go into those transactions, here's our two purchase orders. So everything's tied together. We have an audit trail that we can see multiple different ways. It's great. Okay, so just note that the next thing we might do for that, for like Eric Music, the one, the people on this purchase order, uh, I'm, that, that uh, not that one. Oh well, yeah, that one, but let's go into the check. We entered this check and we made it billable. So I'm not gonna record the invoice right now, but just show you what I mean. It's 400 is the, is the cost, not the sales price. We sell it for 500. So if I, if I go into now a plus button up top, I'm like, all right, now we're gonna sell these guitars because we bought them specifically for Eric Music. Uh, what did you do, QuickBooks? Uh, we're gonna go in here and if I put in uh, Eric Music, boom. So it tries to pull in these two billable items, which is great because now you've got this, everything's linked together. But when it pulls it in, you can see that it pulls it in as you get the little link here, but it's at $400. They should be $500. That's the problem. And I don't believe it's going to go to, the, if I recorded this, I don't think it would go to the proper income account because it would just go to the billable income account instead of the sale of product income account because it's driven by that connection to the billable item instead of using the item which should put it on there at the at the pr correct price so you could so again i just want to point that out to be careful with that because i again the desktop version actually does that well it does that properly i think and that system works good so you could still link them together like this i'll show you kind of a workaround later but you have to be very careful if you're dealing with inventory that way so i'm going to leave without saving right now Okay, so let's do the next one. I'm gonna go back, I'm, so I'm in the vendors. I'm gonna open this back up so I can go back to my vendors here. Notice how I'm navigating, not with the back button up top. QuickBooks has a system where everything's basically internal. You shouldn't need to use this back button basically ever uh, within QuickBooks, but it can be a little tricky to get used to. So, but I think it's actually a better navigation system. So then I'm gonna, if you use everything in here and not this, back button up top but if i go into here now we have another one we can do gibson so if i go into uh gibson we had some uh purchase orders that we have in here if we were to enter a bill for them we can hit the drop down and copy to a bill but i'm just going to do the same thing we're going to go directly to a check we're not going to enter a bill we got a bill from them with the box of guitars that we've received but we're just going to pay it off so we're not going to enter a bill into QuickBooks, we're gonna enter it and just pay it with either an expense form or a check form. These two forms are the same, except that the check form has a check number on it, but they both decrease the checking account. We're gonna use the check form because we, we've got that in our worksheet and we wanna kind of see, show you what the check numbers do when we get to the bank reconciliation area in a future course or section. So let's just type in Gibson here. We're gonna say Gips, we're gonna type in Gibson USA and then QuickBooks gonna say, hey, we have two uh, purchase orders. So we can add those two purchase orders at the same time into the same one. We could do it one at a time or we can just add all of them and save ourselves a click. That's what we'll do right here. That'll help me to run more reports. I can run more reports because I've got more energy because I saved myself a click right there. So then we've got, 1005 the check number populating automatically now and so that is good and then down here it's not in the categories because we're not going to be charging it to telephone expense or even inventory account directly but instead use the items down here the items are going to be the thing that tells it what category to go to which of course will be inventory but it will also be tracking the sub ledger related to it so once again we have one of these two that we purchase directly for a customer the customer doesn't matter on the purchasing side of things but the fact that i see that when i get the box of of guitars reminds me hey i need to turn around and create a 
uh, invoice for this. Now, again, you probably don't want to do the billable and the tax thing here, or, or possibly not. You might just want to make the invoice from this information because of what we talked about last time. But I just want to show you a few times how that pulls in and how you might use that as a workaround if you do want to use that to then populate your invoice. So this is another check form. Check form means, what's it gonna do? Decrease the checking account, it's a check form. The other side, where is it gonna go? It's gonna go to inventory driven by the items in dollar amount of 6,896, the cost of the inventory, not the sales price. And it's also gonna track the units of inventory on the subledger inventory valuation summary. So let's save it and close it and check that out. So we'll save it go on over to the balance sheet, repeat the process to check it out, run in to refresh it. I can, I see that run was so easy because I saved myself some energy with a click last time. So I was ready to run. And then I'm going to go in here and we're going to say that we have the checks. So here's uh, Gibson. So there it is. If I go into that one, notice the new reports here. Uh, there it is. That looks good. They have this red, the red with the decrease. I kind of like their new reports, although it's a, it's a little bit tighter because they don't use the full screen. They got these margins on the right. So I'd like to have as much space as possible so I can expand my columns, you know. But still, I kind of like it. We'll see if they keep it. I think they will. Exit without saving. And then the other side's going into the inventory. We still haven't hit the income statement with it. Noting, by the way. And so down here, we have ch two check numbers 1005 because QuickBooks is trying to break out each line item, possibly to help track the units of inventory on a first in first out flow assumption method. Let's go back again. So notice if notice we're putting this inventory account just want to point out is an accrual account, right? Because uh, if it was a cash based system, we would have just expensed the inventory when we purchased it because we just paid cash for it. And it would have been on the income statement as let's say cost of goods sold. What's the problem with that? If you did that, you'd have cost of goods sold the expense on the books that's not tied to the related revenue. That might not be a problem again in some cases where if I bought the inventory in that situation, for example, if I bought the inventory directly for a particular person then I and I don't hold on to the inventory, then that might be fine because it's only going to be a two day distance between when I buy the inventory, pay for it, and when I sell the inventory. So I might just say I'm just going to expense it. Cost of goods sold will be on there for two days before I then turn around and sell it. And therefore, I might not I might just use a cash based system where I don't track the physical inventory, right? I, you know, I, that's one way that you could do it. But if we're going to be holding the inventory in the shop and I have a bunch of guitars in the shop, then you could see why that's a problem from an accrual standpoint, because now I'm, I'm expensing the expenses, but I, but I would like to tie that into the time that we actually sold the inventory from an income statement standpoint. And if I have guitars that are actually in the shop, I want to track the guitars that are in the shop and make sure that I have a physical count of them and I'm managing them. So when people steal them and whatnot, that I actually am aware of it and I can at least complain and shake my fist in the air in a useless effort of making myself feel better. But then if I go, if I go to the inventory here, 46868, and we take a look at the, 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 the inventory valuation summary, we can update that report and then we have the units of inventory and then the 46868. So, so that's, see this account is similar to like the accounts receivable, right? Where we want to track the accounts receivable on the balance sheet because we want to manage collecting of the receivables. We want to track the inventory on the balance sheet as well so that we can manage the collectible or the sale and, the, and the holding on to the inventory. So that 46868, ties into what we have over here. Okay, let's do it one more time. Back to the first tab, and we're gonna say the next person was on the second tab. So now let's go in the second tab. So once again, I'm gonna go back to the vendors, but I'll, well, let me just check out in the expenses over here and note the purchase orders. If I look at the purchase orders, filters, 
by open purchase orders, now we only have the one left, right? So, so this last one, the diamond head ukuleles. And then if I go into the vendors section, so now I'm in the vendors. And uh, if I look at my one purchase order left over, we can go into that. There's my last purchase order. Uh, if I go back to the vendors here, or I clear the filters, let's say, just to check the Gibson USA, if Gibson was to contact us now, we can say, okay, we sent out these purchase orders. If I go into the purchase order, I can see that it's closed and I can see the link to the check and go to the check. There's the check. I can actually find the check. So everything's linked up. Very nice. Close this back out. If I go into the check and they have a question about it, I can say, well, I sent the check out. It's outstanding or did it clear? I can check the bank to see if that happened. And then within the check form, it's linked to the purchase orders and I can go to the purchase orders. Very good. Mui B to the end, B N. All right. Hippies are just being man, but why would you just be in when you can Mui be in? When you can Mui be in? Eh? I'm gonna go back here. Let's do this one more time. Last one, diamond head. Let's go to the plus button again, and then we're gonna go check. And we're gonna say this is diamond head. That's a hard head. This guy's got a hard head. We're going to say that it's going to be add all. Okay, so same process. Boom, boom. And we'll keep the date the same. Check number populating automatically. Nothing's in the category because we're buying inventory. We're buying a diamond head ukulele. Three of them pulling in. We're not buying them for any customer in particular. We just like having some ukuleles in the store because people like the ukes, the ukuleles. So what's this going to do? Decrease the checking account because it's a check form. The other side is going to go into inventory for the dollar amount of $72 and the sub ledger will be impacted tracking the units of inventory. Let's go ahead and save it and close it. Check it out. Go into the balance sheet to do so. Run in the report once again, checking out the checking. And it's always fun to check out the checking. There it is, 1006. There's our $72 ukuleles. That's what we pull people in with. There are only seven. There's only you could buy the ukulele just for a few bucks. And then when they and then we sell them that $777,000. No, we don't do that. That's not nice. I'm going to go into the inventory. And then we're going to say this is going to be there's the the side of it going back. Nothing's on the income statement. Nothing's on the income statement because we haven't sold the stuff yet. So still nothing's happening over here. We're just financing our business. We're going to make money soon. It takes time. Okay. I'm getting worried. This seems like a lot of outflow of money without any info. That's how it works. That's why you make the, that's why business owners make the big bucks because they take on the risk, right? That's what they, anyways. So here's the $4, 46,940. That should be tying into the balance sheet here, uh, 46,940. So that looks good. And just a quick check internally, if I go back on over here, we can see that in the expenses area, no more open, uh, open purchase orders. They're all closed now. Mui B to the end, B in. And the vendors, we've got no more purchase orders here. If I clear the filter, and we go into diamond head that he's such a hard head. We have, we call him a diamond head, such a hard head. Okay. We're going to go into there. We have a purchase order and we can see that the purchase order is closed and it's linked to the check. Great. And there it is. So then let's, I think that's it. So this is where we stand now on the balance sheet at this point. This is where we're at. We've now got the inventory. We, we got the money. We got the loan, we put in our own money, we bought the, the fixed assets, the furniture, so we have a beautiful shop that people wanna come into. And now we've got all the guitars that are like hanging all over the shop and that's gonna make people wanna come buy the guitars and we're ready to make some sales, but we haven't done it yet because thus far there's nothing on our income statement, which is worrying our partners here uh, because we, because it seems like a lot of outflow, but we're not worried 
because we have a beautiful shop and it's going to happen. People are going to want to buy our stuff. So then we're going to go into the trial balance. This is where we stand. Now, this I think is the best report to compare your numbers to. So uh, so you can you can check out these here. So the first bit are the assets, liabilities, equity, income and expenses. So checking account, asset, accounts receivable, asset, inventory, asset, investment, uh, asset, accumulated depreciation, contra asset, because it's intimately linked to part of, in essence, the property, plants and equipment, furniture and fixture. The accounts payable, there's our first liability, the visa payable liability, that's a credit card, loan payable liability, and then the equity, the 65000 in the investment that we put in and the owner's equity representing the income generated over the life of the company that has not yet been distributed in the form of draws in the case of a sole proprietorship or partnership, it would be in the case of dividends if it were a corporation.